Alrighty. And I'm back. Hello, and welcome to Titan Wargaming for part two. So this morning, uh, let me grab one. We got all the shading done. The all over shade for the Tyranid Swarm. I have reloaded my copy. And I've made sure it's in a white mug for maximum potential hijinks when I mix it up with my water pot. <laughs> Didn't really think that one through. So, the next step is dry brushing. I'm going to go back with the dry brush of Nurgling Green. So this is the same color that I've used uh, as the base coat for everything. So by using the Nurgling Green, we're just going to help pick out the, some, the first layer of highlights and add a bit more depth in between the base, the shade, and the first round of highlights. So, throw that on the Vortex Mixer for a second. Ooh. No suppression works, it doesn't actually come through on the microphone. Now, there's a lot of discussion that's happened about um, how to dry brush, um, keeping the brush damp, trying to get smooth transitions and stuff like that. That doesn't matter for me. Um, because of what we're doing for this army, it's okay if it's a little bit scratchy, a little bit dry. Um, by the time we do this screaming skull round of dry brushing, by the time we add in a varnish and some streak and grime, it's not going to be overly, overly important if it's buttery smooth or whether it's a little bit scratchy. Um, if it is a little bit scratchy, that's fine. They're pyramids running through a swamp. Um, I did also grab, over the break, an example of one of the swamp bases that I've done. So it's going to be a very similar sort of thing. There will be a lot more color added, um, just to make it a little more alien. And even in normal swamps, you see a lot of you know, flowers and stuff like that. So it's just going to be trying to add that extra layer of color and contrast to the model. So we can get started. The one thing I do agree with when talking about dry brushing and all of the discourse about that, MDF works really well for getting the paint off your brush when you've got too much in there. Um, it doesn't cause the paint to dry out as much. Whether it's as important as having the brush, you know, that extra damp bit or whatever, I don't know. But for getting paint off the brush like that, it's fine. So, just all over. And it's just to try and add some color variation in. Um, the wings in particular are going to need a lot. And you can see how quickly that starts to work. Um, a lot of people say you've got to do just downward strokes. And that's fine depending on what you're trying to achieve because I'm trying to get more of an all over highlight. For this, I don't mind so much if I go up, down, left, right, whatever. Um, for the Screaming Skull, I will try and do it more of just a downward stroke. Notifications coming through. Yes, I'm aware that I'm live. I'm the one that pressed the button. So you can start to see how it's lighting things up. So, go back over there. And just the same as we've done with the shades, we're gonna keep going backwards and forwards, um, adding more paint from the pot, because I'm not gonna sit there with the pot open and let it dry out and potentially spill. So I just tap down until I'm satisfied that I'm going to get enough without overdoing things. As 
Still haven't decided on an eye colour and stuff for these guys. It doesn't take very long, so I'm hoping before I've got to take off and go out to dinner with the missus, that I might be able to get all of this done. I want to get, if I can, both sets of highlights done and move on to the red shade. And if the brush does feel like it's starting to get a bit too gummed up, I can clean it. I've got another fresh brush over there, then I've got another brush after that, so we'll have plenty of time for it to dry properly in between. Uh, that spot there is going to need, yep, because there was a uh, pool of shade there, that's okay. Just keep it going for all of the highlights. While I was having a break, I did get to watch a, or start watching a wonderful video. Um, it was an interview with, uh, I think his name's Steve Box from Vanguard Tactics. Talking about sportsmanship in events. I think honestly that's a really good video that everyone who goes to events should watch. Um, you probably heard of, well, if you've been in wargaming tournaments, you've probably heard of the controversy of one of the events he went to, his opponent got yellow carded for poor sportsmanship. Um, I think he's handled how he does that really well. How he talks about that. He didn't name the opponent. Um, I did see the opponent get named at the time. I don't remember the name. I will not drop that name here, even if I remembered it. I think it's really important to have discussions about that because I see a lot of tournament players get labelled as being win at all costs and our tournaments are so toxic and stuff like that, but really, I've not had a lot of experience with that from going to tournaments. Especially the tournaments I go to, it's about sportsmanship and having fun and Trying to screw your opponents over isn't a focus. I mean, sure, you, people want to win games, but people want to win games and have fun. And the fun part is the most important part for a lot of people. Like, I know from personal experience, I show up to events like Arc 40K, um, hosted in Melbourne if you're not from around Victoria. Um, one of the biggest one of, if not the biggest tournament in Australia, the 40k. And one of the key discussions they always have leading up to the event and at the event itself is don't be a prick. Have fun. If you have a dispute, try and resolve it at the table. Don't fall over the TOs unless you have to. Be a good sport. Remember that everyone's taken a weekend off from whatever it is they normally do for that event. And that means that there's going to be people there who are going to be, like myself, tired dads. You're going to get people there who are, you know, pro players. Um, it can be a lot of fun for the event. And being a good sport there i found is more rewarding for me than winning every game or winning, let's be honest, winning any games for me. Like I'll show up there and I'll lose five out of six games for the weekend, but I genuinely have fun over those weekends. Um, the first one I went to, I had a bit of a rough time because I played a couple of Tau players and they all played shield drones in different ways. So I was left confused by the end of the weekend, not knowing who was doing it right, who was doing it wrong, and it turns out both players done it wrong. But we still had fun games. And the fact that they got that wrong, 
didn't really detract from my standing in the tournament because I was losing those games anyway. Um, and it was a learning experience for me on trying to double check rules and how to be a good sport about that. Um, I think stuff like that is more important. When we go to events, there's two types of events. There's events like R40K where people expect you to go there and have fun. And if someone gets their rules wrong because they haven't had enough practice, or um, they're getting rules wrong because someone has taught them the wrong way and they ha don't have that rules knowledge to decipher how it's written, stuff like that happens. If you go to events like I've done um, BTC last year, which is the Victorian Teams Championship, if I was going to that sort of event, I would expect my opponent to know their rules well enough that that sort of stuff isn't happening. But that doesn't mean I didn't have fun going to BCC and getting the absolute crap beaten out of me. I got crap beaten out of me by some of the nicest people I've ever played against. So it wasn't a bad weekend. It was a learning experience. And if we go into events with that sort of mindset, we get to have more fun at the event. The top players are top players because people play them. You know, they're not that guy who shows up to a, your local store wanting to beat the crap out of you with his Imperial Knights, knowing that you're only two games into ever playing. These are the guys that show up to a game store or a local club and people want to play them because they're good people to play. That's how they get so much experience. That's how they become top players. Be being that guy that's there beating newbies black and blue, the rest of the club notices that and they don't want to play it. I've had incidents that um, when I was working at a game store, I've had instances of veteran players thinking they know rules that they've not read. I've had instances of players that not knowing their army or their basic rules and how things function. And, you know, the, the veterans that listen and learn how the rules work are exactly the sort of people you need in a community. You don't want to be that guy and show up and go, well, that's not how that rule works because I didn't read how the rule changed in whatever edition it is now. You can't be playing 6th ed, 7th ed rules in 8th, ninth, and 10th edition. And sitting there berating a newer player because that's not how you think the game should work when the rules have clearly changed and been written differently, um, that doesn't get people wanting to come back and play. That doesn't help the community grow. That doesn't help your local store stay in business. And if that's a club, that means that eventually people are going to stop showing up to that club or you're going to show up to that club and people are going to say, no, I don't want to play you. Which is exactly what's happened to a couple of people that I've known. And it's not a nice thing to see happen to someone that they get ostracized from the community and stop getting games but unfortunately for some people that's the only way they will ever learn to read rules and if they don't want to get on board and read those rules as sad as it is because i would love there being many many more people um locally playing those players that are unwilling to adapt and unwilling to be good sports are the ones that destroy communities. And I'm not just talking about um, Warhammer here. I've had the same thing happen for card games. You know, being in a being in a game store, I've hosted card game events many times, and watching veteran players be assholes there's no other word for it, or no other acceptable word for it, to newer players, um, 
that just stops the community growing. Especially if the community is only small to start with. Like, if you've got a community of, you know, 10 players and one person is making every new person that comes into that community feel like shit, eventually that community doesn't grow anymore. Word spreads. And if that community doesn't grow, over time people will eventually leave because they've got other stuff going on in their life or they've left the area because that happens. Eventually, you have no community. If you have no community, you miss out as well. If you're that guy and you're being an asshole about things and all of a sudden your community's dead, you need to ask yourself why. What could you have done better? And I know working from a game store, one of the things I could have done better when I've seen those things is to be more proactive in calling them out and making sure that the rules are very clear. One day I would like to go back to working or managing a store. I would love to own a store. And that experience I got working for someone else and seeing that happen to more than one community, I now know how I need to deal with it. But very few people will actually get the chance to work in a game store. Um, some people like where I am now, I don't have even have a chance to go into a game store very often. And when I do, I've got to travel, you know, 45 minutes away up to the border or over to Bendigo from where I live um, just to get a game sometimes depending on what game I want to play because I play War Machine I play Warhammer I want to play Star Wars Armada you know seeing how those negative players can really really disrupt a community and honestly destroy a community I should have done better when I was working at that store, and I know to do better now. I think we're nearly halfway through the tournaments. Keep going here. Yeah, I see like gaming clubs in Melbourne and I know some of the people from events that are managing and helping out with those clubs. And it's not hard to see when you've got those sorts of people running those clubs, why people come back every week. Like, um, Warplings. Irish Kroger, I think his name is. Um, seen him at VTC, we got to sit down, we got to chat. He is a really nice person to spend your time with, even if you're not playing a game. Our team got the shit beat out of us by his team. But every one of them was a wonderful player and a wonderful person to play against. That's my rant for the, this session. <laughs> 15 minutes of me talking about sportsmanship at events and why we need to do better as communities. And I do know, what, like, the wargaming community where I am. There's a lot of people now who will not play Weimar. Um, various reasons. Some don't like the way Games Workshop handle themselves. Some don't like the um, financial level. Some just have a bad taste in their mouth after dealing with that guy. And I can't blame money at this point. I don't really care about the financial situation. Um, if I wanted to do something where I was being more financially responsible, honestly, I would just 
stick to PC games, maybe. Get into car restoration, that'd probably cost me less money than Warhammer cost me. <laughs> but I'm spending money on something I enjoy. And for me, that's important more so than is this the best financial decision or um, is Games Workshop the best company? Because I have criticisms of Games Workshop. I think they do a lot of things. I believe that their slogan should be great rules written badly. Because while the rules themselves are great and they're a lot of fun, and they take care of a lot of aspects such as how things should act in in game versus in law. Their wording is really bad. Um, and I think they need another editor or two. Um, especially seeing the way some of the things have happened for 10th edition where rules come out and the rule for one unit is different to the same unit in a different army. Like rhinos. Maybe I've had too much coffee. Go on, um, the Games Workshop's great at doing some things and the clarity of their rules is not one of them. The pricing is not honestly one of the best, but I'm also seeing a lot of companies that are really catching up on pricing for GW and not offering, sometimes not even offering the same quality And then I see the 3D printing community and quite often when I see people talking about 3D printing, they're not being honest about what it really costs to do 3D printing. Yeah, I see some people talk about it, it cost me $50 worth of resin to print my army. Well, first of all, what the hell resin are you using to print that many models? Because I've seen mates doing 3D resin printing and that is a hell of a lot more resin than a hell of a lot less resin than people are using generally to print armies. Uh, also, there's the cost of consumables, so you, gloves, isopropyl alcohol, all that sort of stuff. There's the initial setup costs. It's fine to say it cost me fifty dollars worth of resin to print this army. That's actually more honest. But by the time you add in all of the consumables, buying a printer and stuff like that, having to learn how to deal with um, 3D editing software, because sometimes you will have to make changes or, you know, add your supports yourself and stuff like that. I, I don't want to be bothered learning to do that. That's why I get someone else to print stuff for me. Um, you know, when you spend $800 on a printer, I could have spent, spent $600 on my custodies, I think, for an entire army. So there's a lot of dishonesty in some of the community. Like the reason I let, I go to Rob to print stuff for me is he's very honest. His prices are within expectation and he will check back on me to make sure I'm happy with quality before he brings stuff over to me. Um, there are other people I've used for 3D printed parts in the past. Uh, Pop Goes the Monkey, for example, does fantastic bits for 40k. A little more pricey, but priced within expectation of what I would have. It's not necessarily cheaper than going to GW and buying stuff. Oh, when it comes to individual parts. By the time I pay for postage and stuff like that. But it's stuff that GW doesn't produce, especially shoulder pads. You know, shoulder pads and shoulder icons and stuff like that. At one point I planned on doing a Salamander's army and then I realized having two marine armies was just a dumb idea. So I ended up selling it off. Because two basic marine armies and one of them being a custom chapter meant I could use any set of rules. Um, if I was doing something like, you know, I'm going to do grey knights and I'm going to have normal marines, that would make 
more sense. But I bought all the shoulder pads and stuff like that. All these grand plans on how I was going to do this army and went, ah, oh, I could just use mine. I could just use my Marines, my chapter. And instead of spending money on a second chapter, I could just add those units to my chapter and use the same rules anyway. And now I have more Marines than I could ever paint. And the collection keeps growing. I think by the time I add in all the stuff from um, Leviathan, I think I'm pushing 550 Marine infantry in bikes. Plus now I've added a couple more Dreadnoughts in. I think I'm up to about eight or nine, maybe 10 Dreadnoughts. Okay. I need to add more vehicles in, so that's gonna just push numbers all the way up. I also have some heavy intercessors sitting over in, over there. I haven't included those in either. So, you know, it's both helped and hurt because now I've just committed to, I'm going to build an entire chapter instead of having, at the time, I think I had two or 300 Marines, but I'm okay with that. I am the poster child for poor, for poor financial decisions. One Leviathan box wasn't enough. I ordered two. One Indominus box wasn't enough. I ended up with three other things. I still have Necrons over there that aren't assembled. I have submarines that aren't assembled. I have Necrons that still need from the first wave of stuff that I bought that still needed shoulder pads painted. And that's actually about all that need painted, so I'll probably do that on stream at some point. Um, I still have assault intercessors that are sitting brand new on sprue. And that's after I sold some, some of the assault intercessors because I realized I had 10 too many. I had 10 more than I would ever use. I can in theory use them because of how they didn't have a troop choice in previous edition, uh, how their battle line in the current edition. I could use up to 60 of them. I will probably never use more than 30, but I have 30 sitting there. I have 60 intercessors sitting there with the bolt rifles. Because at the time, bolt rifles were a different weapon profile. Now, I will probably not sell off those in case something changes in the future and they go back to having different profiles because there was 20 of each weapon variant sitting in a box. Well, I'll them still sitting on through, but yeah. I never claim to be good at finishing my projects. That's why I do it on stream, because then I have to do it. Um... <laughs> You know, if they change the rules back at a later point where there's the three different variations of bolt rifle, I want to have 20 of each because I'd like to be able to run three or four squads. Psychophage. Yeah, I didn't think that either, did I? It's the YouTube settings. Dog's trying to get into the shed. He can stay out there. Well, I say stay out there, he's inside the house. But whenever I'm out here, he feels like he's missing out. And if I let him in here, he's just going to start scratching at the door to get back inside because he realizes that in here is boring. There's a lot of spots in here where 
extra colors and stuff are going to be really cool. I do really love this model. It's a pity that it is a um, by default monopose model. I am going to have to try and work out how to make the other one look a little different. Um, maybe I can slice the arm joints a little bit, move stuff around. It would be rather interesting to have it so that it's like up and back. But that'd take a lot of modeling work that I'm not, um, not that skilled to do. Maybe off. If I can make bits join on a 90 degree angle, I'm pretty okay with it. Organic stuff. I don't have the knowledge. Um, and I haven't developed that skill set to be able to make that look good. Maybe in the future they'll do a um, full kit for it. If I'm lucky. Have some more coffee. And models left for this bag. Couldn't get any more streaming skull this there when I was in Melbourne. I couldn't also also couldn't get any Nurgling Green. Um so I'm glad that I've got enough to get this done. And I have ordered some more online. Because at some point this week, I'm going to have another box of this stuff to do. I don't know if I'll stream the other box. If you do want to see that, leave a comment. While you're there, don't forget, like, subscribe. No, I don't care if you actually like it. Click the button here. I think all up, um, so I did use the app and I did and everything up. I think it comes up to being like 800 points per side. Well, 800 bucks for, uh, 800 points for one Tyranid side of the box set. I haven't looked at the Marine stuff. Barely even looked at the data sheets for Marines. I've had a lot of look at Necrons. Because they were my... Nice edition, are we? Um, at some point, when I do get around to painting more of the Necrons I've got there, and I get through and paint more of the Marine stuff that's there, I would love if... Um, one of the guys took them for a run on one of the streams if I don't happen to get a chance anytime soon to play on one of the game streams. Um, oh yeah, my whiteboard fell down. That did have details for the next stream. If you didn't catch that, go back and watch the previous video. I'll try and have it fixed for tomorrow. <laughs> I will say it is due for Friday at 8 p.m. We have two armies lined up, but neither of... Oh, I don't think we've had either of the armies so far. I know I have personally played both of those um I played against both of those armies in the past. Not for a long time. That's it. First round of dry brushing done.
Uh, if you're wondering how to get rid of some of the extra stuff off the brush as well, yep. Uh, hand sanitizer actually works wonderfully. As long as it's an alcohol based hand sanitizer, it will break apart the paint well enough to get your brushes cleaner. They're not perfect, but it's just cleaner. And it will help them dry faster. And as an added bonus, the moisturizer in it helps soften up the bristles a little if you're starting to get a bit stiff on them. Nerdling can go back there, screaming skull can come out. Give it a good mix. My fiance bought me a vortex mixer and it's also been fantastic because I don't have to shake the paints as much and it doesn't leave me as sore because after I do a lot of painting, I've been shaking pots all day, my shoulders really do start to get sore. Um, having the problems I have with my body, it's not really surprising that, it shouldn't really be surprising that I physically struggle with a lot of stuff. Oh, that's, oh, that's what happens when you don't take enough paint off your brush. Uh, okay. I don't mind so much on the wings. Uh, so I was thinking about doing wings with the screaming skull anyway so i can hit actually do that sort of now as long as i'm a little more careful with it and then when i add the red shade in things will be a little better so I just want to be gentle with this. Get a good amount onto the inside of the wings. Oh well, like I've always said on my streams, mistakes will happen. I'll just paint that with some red shade around the wing membranes. Uh, remember what I said red shade, I was talking about the mix of Volupus Pink and um, Lamian Medium that I'm going to make up. I will be making that up live so you can see it. Rainbug. So yeah, I'll use that, I'm gonna use that to accent the end of the tentacles on the brain bugs and um, any areas that would be a little more red, so joints and stuff like that. Yeah, just got to be more careful. Make sure I actually get everything out of here. To the point where I'm just doing a big fine highlight. So. Still coming out very wet. I think the brush might be a little too wet and holding the paint too much. But there's not much else for it at the moment. Just got to kind of go with it. Um, otherwise, the model itself just won't look right.
I don't think that actually is too bad. Either. If it looked that bad, I would actually have to go through and uh, strip the model and start again. But I think at the moment, what I'm going to do is clean up this brush and go to the drier one. I've got the third of the brushes. I do have a fourth one somewhere. I don't know where it is. out of here um it's like it feels pretty dry but obviously it's still got too much moisture in there this one is bone dry this one hasn't been used in probably a couple of weeks so it better not have any moisture sitting in it and even just looking at that i can see it's a lot drier. And that's working a lot better. So yeah, always make sure your dry brushes have the right moisture level. And we can go back again and see the difference between the two, how it gets a little bit lighter. But we're not losing any detail from it. It's just helping enhance the color variation that's there. I don't know why I picked Screaming Skull, I just looked at it and went, that's going to work. And luckily it did. Because I did not want to keep painting Test model after test, test model. It would have really sucked for me to sit there and do... Well, I, I did it with my custodians where I spent weeks buying different golds and stuff. Trying to find the right gold for me. What gold is it that's going to be my custodian's army? I didn't really have the time or the willpower to do that for two minutes. I just kind of got an idea from mates about what sort of basing style I should go with and run with that for that's how I should paint my Tyranids. And it turns out the second paint scene that I tested was the one that I went with. So if you're ever wondering how to come up with paint schemes, I'm not the person to ask. Because I kind of just Roll with it and hope for the best. Um, a lot of events require you to have a marking for which units which, I think for me, how I'm going to mark my units is going to be that first bit there. It will be a different color. It's still going to be a color that will blend into the color scheme. Um, so I can't, you know, this squad is hot pink. Although hot pink may actually work. Given how I'm going to be basing hot pink may actually work. Um, but the ends try and keep it something will uh, match in with the color scheme and not look completely out of place while at the same time being obvious enough for my opponent that this is squad one this is squad two um, for my necrons i've gone a different path altogether where um, i've got clips on their bases and each clip 
uh, each squad is a different colored clip. So I know that if I wanted to, I could swap that over and use them, uh, use those clips somewhere else. And I may, may at some point in the future, especially given how I've structured my Marine army, um, the heavy weapons in the tactical squads are the same heavy weapons that I use for the Devastator squads. I just have enough of them that I can sort them in and out as I need. So using a clip or something to be able to swap that um, is actually the reason I bought those clips in the first place. I can't get to you to show. I can't get to them at the moment to show anyone. So you'll just have to imagine. Making a good time though, I'm pretty happy with how quick we're getting through this part. Things keep going, I might even get the um, first coat of brown done on the carapace. Or maybe I'll work on some other little obscure detail instead. Who knows? I don't plan this crap. We're halfway through this this layer of highlights, though. This is why I love dry rushing. Cause it's just, when you're doing something like this, it's so quick. And it's the extra details that are going to matter. It's not going to be, did I edge highlight this? It's going to be all of the other stuff that is going to finalize the look of the army. This is just, you know, the vanilla ice cream that you're making the banana split out of. Sure, the ice cream needs to be okay, but that's not the important part. It's everything else that you add on top that makes it what it is. I'm really bad at analogies, but hey. It would be nice too if I could get um, on those little brain bugs, start getting the white in on there. Um, on their brains. Because I won't be doing dry brushing again on the carapace. Uh, the carapace is a lot more deliberate than that. That's where I want to spend more of my time painting. Just the chair a little. So if I can get this done quick enough and spend more time on the carapace, that's what I want to do. And if I can get that one detail done sooner, and have it not affect the final product in which order I've done it in, that works out really well. For these guys, the carapace is going to be a lot simpler than the characters because I'm just going to be straight up spotting on a couple of extra colors. For the characters, I need to come up with more of a pattern. And 
again there will be not really edge highlighting on the characters and the monsters and stuff like that i'm going to be doing um sort of a three-tone color scheme we're going to have two different browns as the main color scheme and then have dots of another two browns on the rest of it so that's actually four colors total um not three because math is hard so um you know i won't be, won't be going through doing you know edge highlight on the edge of each um plate of armor or anything like that and i don't want to dry brush it because if i dry brush it and start adding extra colors in it'll be harder to see the spotting when it's done I think a lot of the time people people are too harsh about you have to edge highlight sometimes um it's highly possible to have a great color scheme that has no edge highlighting at all you can make a fantastic model that has no edge highlighting at all and we see that sometimes with you know golden demon entries and stuff where they've not done edge highlighting they've done volumetric highlighting so the the shadows are where the shadows should be and the highlights are instead of it being a single line they're an area they get brighter and brighter as you go towards the imagined light source well i think that's how we should judge models um less on did they edge highlight and more is it highlighted in a way that the model looks good? Whichever method you've used, does it look good? Um, and that is one of the criticisms I have of events like Arc40K. Sometimes by doing their checklist of you have to have this, 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 and this, you miss out on some fantastic ideas for paint jobs um, because they've had to tick boxes instead of uh, instead of being able to just freeform and paint a really nice model, I've seen some fantastic models get scored down at Arc because there was no edge highlighting. And that, that to me seems like a shame because that's almost saying to someone, don't spend all that extra time doing your own unique paint style, you must paint like this. And I've seen when people get marked down for doing their own painting style, that is really discouraging for them. So just on this fleshy area, I'm gonna come back in a little heavier. Same as, um, we accidentally done on the wing membranes of the tyranny prime just try and build up a little more of that white because we're going to come back in here with our lamy and medium lupus pink mix to add some more detail in here especially on these big fat bulbs. So you can see it's a lot lighter at the back and then we can get into a, sort of like the recesses um, with, with the wash. But the green will still add something to it. Little dudes, the littlest of the little dudes. Time to hit up some neurogons.
doesn't take a lot to get these guys done because they're so freaking tiny. With these dudes, I'm probably not even going to do um, two tones on their carapace. And then the spotting, I'm probably just going to do the one and then spotting. Because their carapace is so tiny, you know, compared to my thumb, to see, for example, um, I don't think I'm going to really have space to go into that level of detail. I'm okay with that. If you're not okay with that, I hope you change your mind. Because I don't want to go insane trying to make something like that work. I have lost enough sanity over my life, I don't have much left to say. It is nice to see how quick it's coming together though. Gives me hope that, you know, because oh, you know, I have mentioned um, to a few people that this is probably going to be my army for Arc 40k next year. Um, there are other models that I want to add into the army. There are some models that I'll probably, in, in order to make up points, I'll take some stuff out, add new stuff in. And we've got the file now for the bases that I want to use, the hollow bases. So they're just a round base, similar to any other hammer base, or there's rounds and ovals. But instead of being open at the bottom and closed at the top, they're closed at the bottom and open at the top. So you can fill it with water effects and stuff like that. It comes up literally like a little puddle. So I have... Um, had Rob get the SEL for that, and he's printing up the bases. I would say as we speak, but I think he's at work at the moment. Um, he's painting up the bases over the next week or two, or however long it takes, um, so that we can have it ready. And I may do, I don't think I'll do a video on it, but. Because you know, I've already done a video on my swamp base, and it's going to be exactly the same sort of thing. Um, I don't think I can really stream it either, unless it's set up. Hurry up and get the airbrush camera set up. But I will definitely post up some pictures of um, work in progress and stuff as I go. I do need to work out some, one of the other things they score at Arc 40k is, um, you know, some fluff beer army. You know, do you have some backstory as to what they're doing, where they are, all that sort of stuff, which is kind of hard for me because I'm, when I go into that sort of creative mode, especially with writing or something, I tend to fall down a rabbit hole and I don't think they want a 50 page thing on my army so I've got to try and keep it down to what they can reasonably view and say yes you've done what we've asked <laughs> so let's get working um, so I have a dropper bottle here uh, how big is this I think it's five mil. That says three mil, that says two mil. That's one, so three mil. Okay. I know what I want as far as ratios because I got a chance to test it. So I want it roughly about three parts lummy and medium. So That's about 
and a half mil. So I'm going to put, yeah, three parts of this. Actually, I'm going to put six parts of this, two parts of the lupus pink. I think it's basically going to run us out of here. Run us out of this bottle. I do have another bottle if I need it. And of course, it's getting a little harder to suck out the stuff out of the bottom. So I just use the last little bit as well. Empty shade bottles. At some point, I want to make a um, hobby table for like gaming made out of hobby supplies. So empty paint pots, dice, old paint brushes, you know, that sort of stuff. And it's going to take two of the, uh, so each one of these is only filling up about half as much as the other one was. that through. I don't know why I'm spending so much time trying to clean this because it is just a cheap little pet and I could just throw it in the bin but you know it's it's plastic I try and reuse plastic stuff as much as I can. start applying it yeah. it should with any luck apply um, rather transparent if not I'll have to go over to the uh, container over there yeah it looks all right all right so around the edges here yeah, it's going on nice and transparently. So we're gonna just gently feather this up. Um, cover the joints. And cover the entirety of the wing membrane. Also, look for any other spots where we might need to add it. So, as I said, joints here, and it's going to dry very pale. We just need to make sure we get all of the joints from every angle that we can reasonably see them. At any points where there's um like you can see the exposed ridges here on the joint there later on we will fill that with just straight volupus pink to add the color there so around the wings there's lots of different spots where we can apply it including around there and then same thing as before, we just gotta get in on that membrane. I think membrane is the correct word for what it is. Um, and there's just in here, there's a tiny little spot where that wing connects, so we need to do that as well. Uh, there. Back of the head, just the back half of the head. Uh, 
doesn't matter if we get it on the um, carapace. There's little flecks of the green and stuff in there as well. Yeah, I'm not trying to be the neatest. I'm not painting this for competition. Um, I've seen people do the same sort of thing with an airbrush. So if that's more your speed, go for it. We're just adding more colors. Within reason, more colors on this sort of stuff works better. Well, sorry, not more colors, more color. You don't want to start adding colors that don't match because then you just end up with a mess. My life's enough of a mess already. I don't need that sort of stuff. Um, get there. I will hit as well, just a little bit in that tail there. There are some grooves. There, we can get there, we can get there. All right. It looks a bit of a mess. It is a bit of a mess because this is me painting, but it will work out once we've got, um, once we've been able to get the rest of the colors on. So, same sort of thing here. Where we've got these lines here, I'm just gonna go down there. That's gonna be our color definition for this part of the body. Body. We don't have a lot of spots where we can add this on the neuro tyrant. Um, it doesn't have many limbs that we can see. We can add around there. Around the ends of here. Ends of the tentacles. Well, ends, ends of these tentacles that have details on them. I'm not going to do it on the ends of all of the tentacles. Um, yeah. There is a couple little spots there where we can add it the joints that we can see. Maybe around there. But for the majority of this model, it's going to be, um, the more important part on most of this model is going to be the carapace. So, get our color in there maybe a little bit there the start of those big tentacles that's going to be our color for that screamer killer lots of big joints lots of big spots to add this in around that plate, around this joint here. As we discussed earlier, the under part of this shell, we've done in that, in, we'll do that entirely. I'll just try and soak it up so there's not too much there. I don't know if you can see it properly, but I'm hoping you can. It looks okay on my screen. Uh, also, 
in there. We can play quite a bit in there. And then we can just go around and hit all of the limbs again. And because this is so transparent, like we're still leaving a stain of the pink. We're seeing the color in underneath. So that's what's going to be important for like how this scheme as a whole shows up. Um, yeah. Don't know what else to add there. Running out of words. I don't really have some inspirational, big inspirational meaning of do this and your model will be better. Just, I think this works best for this model. So we're getting there, I've missed that arm there. Again, we have that part there where there's all those dots where we can fill that in. Make sure that doesn't pull there. And I've sort of do these parts here. I think if I do any edge highlighting on this guy, it's going to be on the um, pause. I haven't fully decided on a color for the claws. I was thinking of like Morgast bone um, and maybe shading that with something unusual. Then I could highlight it again with Morgast bone and you know, get some more color variations in there. I'm not sure. Even just pain, plain, not pain, although putting this together was a pain because it kept stabbing me. Um, even just a plain color bone would be okay. Add some more on. Oop. Don't spill the shades. Spilling shades is bad. Just around the feet, back of the knees, front of the knees. soft and squishy and fleshy. Um, inside the mouth I'm just going to do plain old Volupus pink. Same what I'm going to do for all of the exposed jointed bits. Gentle, gentle. All about just staying the surface. Your gribbly bits can have lots of the color, and we will add some of the extra color maybe in a second coat later. And around the back of the head. A bit there. So, yeah, events. Um, oh. Like I said, I'm planning to take these guys to Ark. So this is enough of an army that I'll be able to learn and decide what I want. I know, looking at some of the data sheets, I'm like, oh, I want a harpy, I want a hive crone, I want, I want, I want, I want. 
and then I've got to try and make it all fit within the points limit the, uh, that Arc does, which is normally 1350, which can be very hard to make armies for because it means you've got to leave stuff out of your army that you would normally put in. So it's an interesting challenge from a list building perspective. What will I bring? What will I leave at home? And that's actually one of the questions they ask you when they're talking about, um, when they talk to you about your army. What did you leave at home? What stuff did you want to put in your army, but through, you know, the theme and the fluff of your army and what's going on as far as your inner story, what did you leave at home? So, you know, if I decided I wanted to do a, um, you know, overwhelming psychic power list, not that psychic power is really overpowering anymore, because uh, there's no real psychic phase, you know, You'd say, you know, I didn't bring this model. I didn't bring the Streamer Killer because he doesn't do psychic powers. Instead, I brought an extra Neuro Tyrant. Instead, I bought a Broodlord. So that's the sort of stuff they look for um, in that section of the marking. For me, I don't know what my theme's going to be yet so once I've worked that out I'll be able to say you know I have left a home this I made sure I bought this because even though it's a bad unit I'm not saying these guys are bad units I'm saying in general <laughs> ah you're painting these exact bugs yeah that's Look, honestly, I'm having so much fun with these guys. It, it's hard for me to keep talking because I'm just like, ah, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm painting and I'm happy. <laughs> so my mind's just running off in all sorts of different directions. So far, we're, what, nearly an hour and a half into painting and we've already finished the exoskeleton and uh, exoskeleton color. We're moving into doing some extra details on it. Um, if you missed before, the stuff I'm using at the moment is a mix of Volupus Pink Contrast Paint, thinned out with about um, two parts Lamy and two to three parts Lamy and medium to one part Volupus Pink because it does just enough to stain the surface without giving me a full bold color. Moot green. See, I did consider moot green, but it wasn't gonna match um, what I'm doing. Cause I, moot green is honestly one of my favorite greens. It's certainly my favorite GW green um, my favorite green overall is actually Liquitex ink, which is, um, a vivid lime. And I've used that for, as like, okay, it's super bright and it stands out super well. So I decided I was going to use it as a recess shade because it added a nice sort of glow to my Necrons. I'm pretty sure recess shadings are supposed to be darker traditionally, but screw it. The black carapace, I black is a hard thing for me to do. Um, even here, like I could have gone with a black carapace, but I end up going with like dark brown. Yeah, getting out of Citadel Paints, when I used to work in a game shop um, locally, all I had access to was Citadel. And then I found 
the joys of titanium white ink for doing airbrush work and that kind of that was what brought me out of um that into doing some tests with some of the artist products i still don't use many artist products as a lot of people use because i do like sticking to gaming painting a lot of the time but it was quite a nice way to break out of it um, using inks it does make it a little hard to do with a brush because they are so liquid that they'll just run off the brush and you'll end up with a big mess really quickly. Uh, there. Now on the gun, I reckon in here can have the same sort of color. I think that needs some. Because I am entirely making this up as I go. Yeah, when I bought an airbrush, I was like, yeah, I'm only ever going to use this for... I'm only ever going to do base colors, and I'm not going to be worrying about blending and all that sort of stuff. That's beyond me, and then all of a sudden... I found myself doing blends and power weapons with an airbrush. I'm always regretting my life choices, because then I start spending more money. I'm, I'm buying a bigger airbrush. And then I destroyed my bigger airbrush because I used the wrong cleaning agent. Because if it strips paint, and this is metal, that can't be too bad for the metal. And next thing I know, I'd eaten through the nickel layer, layer on top of my airbrush. In case you're wondering, don't use simple green in an airbrush. It's great for stripping paint off models, but it will also strip the nickel off your airbrush. I don't know how that works. But it does. So many little joints on this one. It actually looks... It does give a really cool look. Uh, just a little bit in there. And I may come back on that um, Tyranny Prime as this stuff starts to dry and put a little more... Uh, well, actually, I'll just show you when I get to it. Um, put some more of this around where the wing... Like, where the wings are close, membranes are close to the bone. Is, I think the best way I can word it at the moment because I don't have good wording. I just realized I didn't do that part on the other one. The one that I just packed up. Didn't get that done. I'll grab it again in a second. Over head and over this side. The back end of this gun didn't get it. neither did there. I think that's all of it's done. Thanks. Thank you. I hope you have a good day. So what, what time are we up to? Uh, about 2.30. About 2.30 and we're about to hit the small bugs. That's pretty good timing, honestly. I'm happy and surprised that I've got this far. I figured I'd get 
Yeah, it's just far by like four or five o'clock. There. Now that we've had a bit of time to dry, we can actually bring back during time. And you can see how it dries on the um, joints. And what I was talking about before, because it looks dry enough to do, is just coming in there and feathering that up a little bit around there. Adding a little bit of a transition there. And when I was talking about cutting army uh, models from an army list, the Trinity Prime is actually the first one that I would probably cut. Because as much as he looks really cool, he doesn't fit any of the ideas that I've had for an army list so far. Last barb drawn. Make sure we don't miss the gun again. The gun's going to be one of those really interesting things to paint, I think. Because it's, it's such an important part on this model and it's going to have to have so much extra detail added. There's spots where I can use, you know, some yellows and stuff like that to really add depth without breaking too far away from the color palette. These guys, I'm not even going to bother trying to um, blend this too much. I'm just going to put it around the torso, where their legs come out. Um, I'm not going to worry about leaving much showing, because they're so tiny, I just need to have that color on there. I can't get the brush into there, so that's a good sign that I don't need to actually paint there. These are just teeny tiny gribbles and they don't really matter. Would be nice if they, you know, if you could buy these in a pack of like 10, then maybe they'd matter more to me. But I'm not going to, I'm probably not going to earn enough of these to worry about using them because I don't see myself. I don't see myself owning, like, enough termagants and hormigants and stuff to have squads full of rippers screaming across the table. As cool as it would be, I'm not spending quarter of money to buy, like, ripper bases. Little Gribbly? Paint around there. And the Ford World ones don't even mix in well with the old ones, all the new ones of the Ripper Swarms. So it's it's hard to justify that sort of money for something that in my opinion doesn't match. And I'd be able to get 3D printed ones that match better.
least one thing about painting in a big batch like this, no one can complain that my arm is not coherent. <laughs> I've literally used the exact same colors on everything all at once because I am painting the entire army all at once. Probably actually time to move from a smaller brush. Uh, I'm starting to get to all the smaller models now. Paint this one and then I'll think about it. Too bad. Yeah. Smaller brush would be helpful for most of this. Alright. Ah, uh, yeah, there's that there. Do I do it on that side? Yep. Alright. Let's look at the smaller brushes I've got. Uh, those two small ones, this one. That one's never used before. All right, let's give this one a test run. Make sure it's not too wet. such a small tip on it, it's probably actually not that great. Oh, that's right. I'll get used to it. It's just, it's a new brush. I've never even used one from this company before and it holds together a little bit more than I'm used to at the moment because I've been using older brushes but it still works well holds together well and it's getting the job done there Head got done. All right. Number three. Start and get uncomfortable sitting in this seat for so long. Usually I'd have gotten up and had a walk around by now. Which we may have to do shortly. Oh well. I can at least get all of this colour finished, I think. And then I'm probably gonna have to let it sit for the night. Get them all there. Three. It's actually really hard on the blue. Before I swap to the smaller brush, I should have um, done the psychophage. Oh well, I can always pick up the bigger brush. This brush is, however, going to be fantastic for when I start filling in the volupus pink in all of the um, exposed parts. I figured that having a brand new brush would make 
things feel nicer. Who uses brand new brushes? There, there, and there. Swap it over. Try and get one side done at a time. There. You can see that one there, so we can pull that in and along there. It's pretty quick on the production line here. We're already closing on a half a box done with this. Get a bit more on there. It's slowly starting to split a little bit. So give it a good mix up. Because eventually, no matter what you do, paint will separate from, like the um, medium will separate from pigment, no matter what paint you're using, paints or inks or whatever. That's why we often get issues with stuff drying at the bottom of our pots. It's also why it's nice to have water mixer. You know, even throwing some stainless steel balls in your pot and using, helping that as you shake will help mix everything up. And as you see on the um, Terry Prime, it doesn't leave so much color that it's overwhelming. I think it adds just the right depth of there's something there. Speaking of something there, there's a hair in there. There's hair on the tweezers already too. I can't remember where I first seen this done, like this adding a pink washer over an area for the tunes. I want to say Spen's painting, but I don't remember if it was him or not. I know I've seen his um. Dark Tyranids, and they look pretty cool. But I didn't like the idea of putting that many enamel washes onto one model and then, you know, enamel wash, wash it off, enamel wash, wash it off. Seems a little time consuming for me. I want quicker results. I also don't like painting just straight black. Dogs going off at someone. Someone must have walked near the driveway. Such a whiny little dog. Back of the head there. It's 
couple of spots where it's getting a bit too close together on the joints, but I'm not gonna go back and correct it because that seems like a big waste of effort and time. Especially when I've got so many models to do. I'll work out how I'm gonna do the guns later. Because again, the guns are a good way for me to start adding extra detail into the models. Detail that they wouldn't normally have when it comes to painting. Um, a lot of people just still paint them as if they're like a bolt gun. They paint it black and then just add some highlights. And I don't, don't think that works for what I'm doing here. Uh, some people just go and do the exoskeleton colors and then the carapace colors on it. But that doesn't add any depth to the paint job. And I would like to use it to add depth to the paint job. Because realistically, there's only so many ways you can add depth to a paint job like this. Um, you know, adding this pinky, purpley, ready wash is one of those. It'll be really nice um, if I can get these finished, I can actually do a set up all my stuff and take some pretty photos because since I started moving all my painting stuff out of here I haven't set up to do like really nice photos of anything the last thing I've done I don't even remember if I post, posted them up on social media I've done um, some photos of some terrain because I was planning on doing some terrain commissions opening up so if people want me to paint some terrain for them I can um, and that's still on the table I've got a I've got one job at the moment that I'm doing so when I finish that I'm going to take some high quality photos with a nice backdrop and post it all up online the head and yeah, that wrist because as much as I'm not much of a photographer I've learnt some basic skills like how to put up a backdrop and put up lighting and that does surprisingly a lot of work like if you can get a backdrop that's a clean color in my case I have a black one and you can have good lighting your phone will take fantastic pictures even the lighting here now is getting a lot better because I've got um, four studio lights now and I'm only even using two of them at the moment most of you so far on stream has been three during a game because the fourth one was just adding glare instead of adding um, any depth to the light. It was adding glare in the wrong spots. I ate my face. Every time I talked, my face lit up like a Christmas tree. Over half a turn of the now, I think. Yes, yeah, 12 done. Probably eight.
you have any suggestions for a um, name for the Hive Fleet, that would also be appreciated. I do have a name for a Hive Fleet, but that's going to be for a different army. That's going to be the army the kids paint eventually. And the, the name of the Hive Fleet is made up of their first initials. J-A-D-E-C. So Jadek. I'm not going to go for my, you know, asking them to be, you know, hyper consistent. You all have to paint the exact same thing. But I think it would be fun to show up an event one day with, oh yeah, this is my completely incoherent army that the kids painted for me. It would drive some people nuts, and other people would laugh their asses off. I'm here for the people who laugh their asses off. That's something as silly as having my kids paint my tournament army for me. It wouldn't even be a competitive army. Like I've got. Actually, I don't know if it'd be competitive these days. It, it was not designed to be competitive for 9th edition. It was literally, let's just take um, one unit of each troop choice for the kids to paint, which blew out to, uh, let's just do, we'll start at 10, 10 guys for each unit, and we'll go from there, and then I bought more, and then I bought more, and Before I knew it, all five kids were going to be painting a hundred models between them. And that was without doing any character work, any work on characters. So at some point there was, there's going to be a fully painted, like, 120 model Tyranid army that is useless to use, but I'm going to take it to an event. Psycho page last. That's going to be my reward for finishing all the other guys. I get all of these little dudes and the neuro gaunts finished, and then my reward will be doing this to the psycho page because that's going to be fun. And that, I think, is how we need to deal with batch painting. Like, we need to leave, instead of trying to do, you know, 60 warriors, do your 60 warriors, but add in something in the middle to help break it up. Add something at the end to reward yourself, you know. I'm going to paint 60 warriors, but here's my Catan shard of the Deceiver, which is going to be my reward for getting those other guys to this point. And you can batch paint it at the same time. You know, it doesn't have to be, well, this is my character, so I'm going to paint it all separately. Because you can still add that extra little bit of detail when you're painting um, the same colors. Like I done with the Tyranny Prime, I went through and I added the extra detail on the wings. Like I'd done when I was doing the Psycho Feed, and I painted the soft underbelly a little bit more. We need to set up points to reward ourselves so that we keep going. And that's not just for painting, that's for any part of our life. We need to be rewarded. When we do well, we need to be able to get those happy chemicals. 
I'm not great at doing that for other people and rewarding them. I'm trying to learn. Because the happy chemicals are important in our brain. See what on that dude. Free to go. Do there, there, there. There, there. There, there. There, there, there. There, there. And there. And the same on the other side. I think you've seen by now in this sort of step uh, caffeination is more important than precision just get some coffee in you or whatever and go for it rather than trying to make it perfect you just need the energy to get through worst thing you can do when you're doing something like this is stop and as much as I feel like I need a break right now um, stopping at this point would mean I would come back and I would feel less motivated to get it finished but by pushing through I can be motivated to come back and do the next step later on And then, you know, I've got stuff on tonight as well. Fiance and I are going out for dinner. We're going to go out to a Japanese place. And then after dinner, we're looking at going to the movies to see the new Transformers movie. Because even though I'm not a huge Transformers fan, like some mates, they're always good to just switch your brain off and watch. And again, that's something important when you're doing watching movies and stuff. Sometimes a movie is just designed to turn your brain off, watch, and enjoy. Don't think too much about it. Just does it do its job? Does it give you something to do for a while that isn't boring? And do you get to just enjoy it instead of having to Instead of having to think about it, instead of having to try and decipher what the director or the writer is telling you, can you just enjoy it? Little dudes. The little dudes are back. Alright. Hang all that out. job for these is exactly the same. The only difference is the detail is smaller. So our margin for error is a little bit smaller. Meaning, you know, we can't put too much of the shade on, otherwise it's just going to run and cover every part of the exoskeleton. Uh, these guys probably aren't even going to get the lupus pink um, because they don't have like openings that I can see that I could use it on back of the head just to keep that consistently keep the consistency words going throughout all of the models
because these are tiny little dudes and we still want them to match our bigger dudes even though some of our bigger dudes are not that much bigger At least they get done quick. I also like that I've got a, um, one of the reasons I do like streaming is I can actually time then how long it takes me to paint an army. Like I timed my custodies when I was painting them and it was 24 models, I think, finished in 20 five hours and to me that felt really good you know I made good progress I came up with a tile scheme that I think worked I got it done in a reasonable time to a reasonable quality felt good If I can keep that sort of mindset for these guys and get a good quality and a good time, that will keep me motivated to do the next project, which will be the my Storm Legion for War Machine, or I will um, try and finish off some Marines or Necrons. I do kind of lean towards getting the war machine stuff done. Because I would love to film a battle report for with war machine. Or film, film a couple of battle reports, maybe do a stream. You know, get some folks from Bendigo. They have quite an active group there for war machine. Yeah, if I can get some streams going, maybe I can get some of them to come over and join in and Kids on camp, every time a notification comes through, I'm just checking to make sure there's not something horrible happened at camp. Because, <laughs> yes, the kids are away, and I shouldn't have to be worried about them. The kids are away, and I worry about them. So very, very close to finished on this step. Just hit the two hour mark for this session, plus 45 minutes for the last session. That's not bad. I'm not including the time that I just stopped and rambled for. Oh, sorry, I am including the time that I stopped and rambled for because I don't know how long I stopped and rambled for, at what point. If at any point my brush stopped working, I didn't pay attention. So, word that however you want. There are points where I stopped and rambled and I still include that in time. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. That is better wording. Come on, we're so close. So very, very close. I'm actually going to have to think of, um, there's a similar thing with these guys where I'm going to have to stop and think about where I'm going to add. If I took two, two units of these guys, where do I stop and add? Um, something to mark the unit. I 
I could probably do actually the same thing where it's just that first ridge there or the top ridge there is a different color. Time to get our last, hopefully last, of the red juice. I do have a similar juice made up that is um, what I use for airbrushing on. My Space Marine chapter is silver. I had a mix that I made up of uh, Drakenhof Nightshade, Null Oil, and Lamian Medium. Which sort of just mats things down and lets me do some highlights on the vehicles without it being really out of color scheme. Because dry brushing Necron compound on silver doesn't. It works for infantry. Uh, for inventory? What the frick am I saying? Works for infantry after you've washed it with non oil. But pulling a heap of non oil onto a tank doesn't work. So by airbrushing on a thin down mixture of null oil blue and well yeah it's just in that mixture of null oil and blue um it adds enough shading that i can highlight it without ruining the finish and i had a lot of success doing that with the uh drop pods that i've done especially when i added a heat haze in at the bottom of the um, drop pods and added some gray chipping and stuff onto it. Right, last dude in that squad. Not the last dude all over. Um, he doesn't really need any on his face because his face is mostly covered by armor plating by looks of it. Oh no, hang on, there's some stuff here, put it in there. One side is covered by armor plating, the other side is not. Because he's turning his head to the side. And his limbs here are a little more pronounced. So that makes it easier for shading. I just remembered where this guy looks familiar from. Um, if you've ever seen Tremors 3, or even Tremors 2, that face just kind of reminds me of the, um, uh, I can't remember what they call the ones in number two. Screechers? In number three, they learn to fly and they become arse blasters. Because Tremor is, Tremors is very much a um, trope for immature people, a movie for immature people. And it's fantastic for it. The first movie started off like they wanted to make a proper horror movie and then realized halfway through it was just too funny not to turn into a comedy. Right, that one's going back there. Let's get this big boy back out. We've got a lot of work to do on this one. So, start out with here. Remember, we're mostly just staining the surface. It will still pull in some spots, that's fine. back end is mostly just a big ball of flesh. I 
the main thing is that this like even though we've done the greens and stuff to help tie it in the important part was that it's light enough that it will take the wash well so you could even have you know if you were doing something like this, this yourself um, you could have come in and painted it an entirely different color and it wouldn't matter as long as it well, it sort of does the same thing where it's just adding definition. And it does turn out I'm going to need to add just a little bit more because I've got the tentacles at the front that are going to get the same treatment. There. And then I've still got the limbs to go as well. Come in and get this done. This wash is really doing a lot of work for us on adding detail. It's just such a nice step that's really so easy. Helps it make helps make it look like a fleshy abomination rather than I don't know whatever else it would have been. That's right there. Get in there. I don't know how realistic it is for bugs to have this sort of coloration around their joints. Like any sort of coloration around their joints, it's different to their main body. Because I've never really looked at bugs that closely. But it feels... Feels right. Feels right that this bug has it. But all of the bugs in this army have it. And like, it is an odd color to go with the, oh, sort of an odd color to go with the green, but again, it is, the fact that it's an odd color to me almost helps sell it because it's supposed to be natural and natural animals don't have perfectly contrasting and, you know, perfectly well thought out color schemes. It's just. That's the color. Yeah. The color scheme wasn't picked by a committee of, um, or some professional painter or anything like that. into the mouth as well. Clean it up a little bit. As much as we want it covering everything, I don't want it having massive pools. I will probably, yeah, in the inside of the mouth, I will probably come through with pure of a lupus pink later. So I won't be able to do it now with everything being wet. And just double check this. I think this here should have color as well. The 
fleshy abomination that is the Psychophage. So I'm just going to double check that here and time one more time, see if it's if I do need to add any extra detail on these wings. I think I can just gently, gently, gently do that. Add a little more. Just gently pull it all the way up. To help smooth out that transition. On this side, it's not so bad. I only really need to do there. But I will follow it all the way through here. And on the inside, actually, needs that second coat. So on the inside, you can't see the reddish color almost at all. I don't think you can see it well enough, at least. doesn't matter if this one isn't as um doesn't have a transition on it most people are not going to be looking at the inside of the wings thinking that transition isn't smooth enough they're going to look at it and go it isn't it doesn't match the outside of the wings at all so with that done and actually inside of that neck there needs a bit more color I think we are done for the day so thank you for watching uh, tomorrow we'll kick things off probably 10 o'clock again maybe 11 o'clock I'm not entirely sure yet we'll see how late I am waking up <laughs> um, but yeah thanks for watching if you have any comments um, leave them below feel free to like comment all of the YouTube stuff that helps things grow and I'll catch you later. Have a good one.